Are you ready? Yeah? Okay, let's, uh, let's carry on. So, um, uh, just before we carry on with the next one here, the next one is about, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about death is the next one, uh, and it's obviously an important one. I just uh, um, remind you that what we are really looking at now is really the idea of right view. Yeah, We're looking at the things that motivated the Buddha uh, uh, to go forth and to become a monk. We will see this become more clear later on. It's a bit, bit unclear now. I'm just kind of letting you know in case you don't know uh, what is happening here. So we're looking at the idea of right view. And I just wanted to, again, emphasize that uh, the reason why I want to look at this in quite a bit of detail uh, is because right view is the foundation for the entire Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, it is very important. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why people often uh, don't make progress in the Dhamma, why they maybe they come to a point when they feel that the meditation is not working anymore, uh, where they wonder whether they uh, why they're not kind of having some changes in their life, why the virtue is not uh, uh, continuing to change, why the metta is not strong enough, and all of these kind of things that have a tendency to sort of to stagnate in the practice. Uh, and very often I think the reason is because right view has not been established enough yet. Uh, and this is why I want to put quite a lot of emphasis on this idea of right view, so that we can actually look at areas where we can change our attitude, change our way of looking at the world, so as to make the path more productive of results, uh, and we can actually move forward uh, uh, a little bit as a consequence. Uh, and uh, the, um, so the idea of right view, as I said before, it is not something that is static. It is not the idea that you either have right view or you don't have right view. Right view is like a gradual movement of the mind, trying to align your mind more and more with the vision of the Buddha, the way the Buddha saw the world. Uh, yeah, so initially when we start out, we may see the world completely upside down. Uh, and of course, when you become a stream enterer, that means you see the world exactly the way the Buddha saw it. Uh, and so our job is to move closer and closer to the ideal of stream entry, uh, where we see the world more and more in the way the Buddha saw it. Uh, and the way to do that is to do the kind of contemplations that we're doing now. Yeah? All of these things that we're doing now helps us to see the world the way the Buddha saw it. Uh, yeah, what does it mean? What, what does old age, what are the effects on that? How can we be realistic about these things? Uh, yeah, it's simple, very simple stuff. Uh, but simple does not mean shallow. Simple does not mean useless. Uh, often simple is, the, is actually the best kind of practice because if things are simple, it means that we can understand them properly and we can do the practice properly precisely because it is simple. Uh, so we need to contemplate these things, yeah? we need to contemplate also all the aspects of Dhamma, the idea of rebirth we have seen before, Kamma, we are the owner of our Kamma, is a very important thing. We are the owner of nothing else except for Kamma, yeah, according to the Buddha. Uh, the idea of rebirth, the idea of impermanence, very useful to contemplate, uh, yeah? how everything in the world is changing, out of control, uh, you know, and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, the idea of non-self can be useful to contemplate in certain contexts uh, so that we can uh, uh, use that also as part of our practice. It's actually quite possible to do that. Uh, maybe we'll come to that later on. Uh, so all of these are perceptions, ideas that we develop. And the nice thing about these ideas is that they can be developed at any time. Yeah, like I mentioned before, the whole world teaches us uh, Every moment of the day is an opportunity to be taught something by the world around us. Uh, these things can always be developed. Uh, and because of that, uh, uh, it means that we can practice all the time. Yeah? It is not just when you come here that you practice. It is not just when you meditate that you practice. It is not just when you are kind to others that you practice. Uh, but even be in between, if you reflect in the right way, uh, you're always practicing, always moving closer to the vision of the Buddha, the way the Buddha understood these kind of things. Uh, and as you do that, uh, what is happening is that because right view is the cause and the source for the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Sankapa, which means right intention, right purpose, right aim, right goal, yeah? Right purpose is quite nice, we get a new purpose in life. Uh, 
the stronger, the clearer that right view is, uh, the more clear the purpose of your life is going to be. Uh, you know what is important, you know what matters. Uh, and as I mentioned before, also the idea of right view, it also means that the sense of urgency becomes more clear. Uh, yeah, now is the time to act. Uh, I don't know when I will have a, a chance again in the future. Now I have the opportunity. So you take every opportunity. Every moment is important. Uh, it is like you, as I mentioned before, you lodge the right view at the back of your mind. Uh, and it is always there, like a lord, like an overseer, that like guides you every moment of the day. Uh, and you always remember, now, it matters right now what I do, in this very moment, not in one second, but now. Now. Can you feel it? Now. <laughs> yeah? Now it is important. And so you kind of bring it into the present as much as you possibly can. And I, it's a hard to live like that all the time, but it's really worthwhile to live like that. Yeah? Because right now, am I talking right now in a way that makes sense? Am I talking with kindness, with gentleness, with compassion? Am I talking meaningfully? These are the questions I should ask myself with every word I say. I should ask myself those questions. And if I'm not, I need to recalibrate yeah, and say something else instead. So it intensifies the practice. It puts the practice on the pedestal. It makes the practice of Buddhism the number one priority in your entire life. Everything else is subsumed under that practice because that is the very meaning of life itself. Everything else is secondary. Yeah. This is what right view does to you. Yeah. So it is incredibly, incredibly important. And the more understanding we have of right view, and again, I'm going to carry on with this for quite a while, the more things tend to fall into place. Right intention, right purpose, samma sankappa, all of these things then start to work. And then the path kind of uh, unfolds uh, pretty much by itself. Uh, Okay, so let's uh, now go on to the next one of these uh, contemplations. Uh, so the Buddha says, it says, and what should be described as liable to die? Partners and children, uh, male and female bond servants, uh, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, uh, elephants and cattle are liable to die. These attachments are liable to die. Huh? Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attached to such things, uh, themselves liable to die, huh? seeks what is also liable to die. So, um, yeah, so this is the uh, death contemplation, the idea of being liable to die. And, uh, now, this is perhaps the most important of all of these contemplations uh, because it is something that is very obvious uh, and it is something that is very clear. When you die, you really have to die. You, you, know, that you really have to let go. There's not much uh, choice about it. Uh, and it is very powerful because I think it has, can have a very powerful effect on the mind if you do the death contemplation in the right way. And if you look at the suttas, you look at the various kind of contemplations that the Buddha talks about, uh, Maybe the most important one is precisely the death contemplation. Uh, it is called Marana Sati or Marana Sanya. Marana Sati means the recollection of death. Marana Sanya means the perception of death. Uh, and these are uh, very, very common in the suttas. Uh, so um, uh, what does it mean? And what it means is that when you look at the world, you should always notice uh, when people are dying. Uh, yeah? It is a very useful exercise to do. I was just in the United States just a, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the places I visited was Minneapolis, which is really, really cold. Yeah, I thought I was used to the cold because I'm Norwegian, but no, this was way too cold. This was ridiculously cold. It was minus 26 degrees when I was there. Have you ever had minus 26 degrees? Yeah, I, was, I had sandals. I didn't have socks. Yeah. <laughs> It's true, it was minus 26. Whoa, Dukkha. Big, you think you know Dukkha? You don't know Dukkha. I take you to, to Minneapolis in the winter. You have to teach you about Dukkha. <laughs> so, 
But anyway, I was there, and this was the Sri Lankan community, Best, most, mostly Sri Lankan people who invited me to go there. There are Sri Lankans spread out of, all over the world. They are, you know, they are everywhere, and then they kind of invite you, and they're very keen Theravadan Buddhists. So. And so I did a retreat for them, and one of the people who was looking after me was this man called Channa. There were two main people looking after me, one called Nandana and one called Channa. And then he looked after me, and he always saying, oh, are you... Are you going to be cold, Venerable? You ha don't have any socks? I said, no, no, no need to worry about me. I said, I'm Norwegian. I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, big, big mistake, right? So, <laughs> so he always wanted to give me more clothes. I always refused. And I actually, I, it was actually not so bad. I'm just exaggerating a bit. Uh, it's important to exaggerate for effect. Ajahn Brahm says, never get the, let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? So that the truth, the truth is irrelevant. <laughs> So anyway, he looked after me, and we had a nice retreat together, and then I went on to Chicago, and then I went to New York, and then I went to Boston afterwards, and I came back to Australia, and just a couple of days ago, I got an email. He had died. Yeah. And he, I was told, the email said that what happened to him was that he was, he was in, uh, gone overseas. Where, where was he? In Canada or something? Uh, no, in, no in, in New Zealand. That's right. He was in New Zealand. Uh, and he was sitting having breakfast or lunch or something with his wife. Uh, and suddenly he said to us, oh, something is feeling strange in my body. And then he fell over and died. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Uh, it's kind of strange. He was someone who was just a few days before. He was alive right there in front of me. And suddenly he's dead. Uh, and these are kind of the waking up moments in life when you see these things happen. Uh, so when you see people dying in your midst, yeah, when you read about people dying in the newspaper, someone here in the Buddhist Gem Fellowship dies, uh, someone in your family dies, yeah, we all have people died in our family, uh, don't kind of brush it aside. Uh, don't think, that's not me, that's someone else. Uh, that could be you. Uh, one of the most problematic things that we do when people die, we tend to other those people. Uh, that's not me, that's not my life. My life is different. I eat healthy, I have healthy food, I do exercise, yeah? It's not going to happen to me. It is going to happen to you, guaranteed. Huh? We delude ourselves to somehow think that our life is not the same as the life of the other people. But actually, your life is exactly the same. Huh? So every time you read about someone who is dying, huh? every time you see someone who is dying, whoever it is, huh? remember that could be you. One day it's going to be you, huh? And as you do that, you start to take on board the reality of this idea of dying. Yeah? It is a very important reality. And uh, this is how basically how you do it. Uh, this is one way of doing it, reminding yourself that the dying in the world is also your dying, potentially your dying every time. Uh. The other way to do it, to do it is to remember that uh, people die in all kinds of crazy ways. Uh, right? It's kind of weird when you start to read the newspapers that people die. Uh. Obviously, traffic accidents is a very obvious one. Sometimes people just walk down the street, they just stumble, they fall over, and they die. Yeah, this happens in the world. If you here in Malaysia, just like in Australia, there are dangerous snakes. You walk in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah, and uh, or even at the right time, still the snake comes out and bites you. Right, bang, you're finished. And this is the reality of life. It is so uncertain. Right now, maybe you have a cancer inside of you that is growing right now. You probably do, actually. Everyone has cancer cells in them, apparently, they say. Sometimes those cancer cells start to grow out of control. We just don't know when it's going to happen. It may already be happening. And once you start to understand all the causes for death in the world, you start to see how uncertain life actually is. And this is how you develop the Marana Sanya, understanding the danger of these things. Yeah. Then the Buddha says, which is also interesting, that we should actually bring the idea of dying as close as we possibly can. It is not just that we are going to die, but we don't know when we are going to die. So are you ready to die in a month? Yes? Okay, excellent. Sadhu, sadhu. Okay, I'm going to challenge you more. Are you ready to die in a week? Not, not a week, okay? So that, that, that's your limit, right? So a month and a week. So, so, so that's where you have to work. You have to work, now bring it down to a week. Yeah. And then the Buddha says, well, it, 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 actually this is not... Then it's a Buddha questioning the monks. And the monk says, well, are you ready to die in one day? Tomorrow? 
It's getting more every every time you come close, it's getting more challenging, right? Because it's becoming more and more real. Are you ready to die this evening? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> you have to be ready if it happens, right? You have no choice. But are you really ready? That's the question. Are you ready to die after we have finished this session? Are you ready to die after taking five more breaths? Are you ready to die on your next breath? And this is what the Buddha is saying. He's actually saying, this was a discussion the Buddha has with the monks. And one monk was saying, oh, I'm ready to die tomorrow. This is how I kind of do death. But the Buddha said, that's not good enough. And it goes all the way down to being ready to die on the next two or three breaths. Like, okay, that's good enough. So basically, you have to be ready to die on your next breath. That's what the Buddha says. You want to bring it as close as you possibly can. And it's actually very hard to imagine even dying on your next breath, right? It's really difficult because it's just so incredibly close. So this is the kind of question you should ask yourself. And if you don't feel ready to die on your next breath, you should ask yourself why, what is going on, what is happening here. So do the death contemplation. Remind yourself that you could die at any time. You don't know when it's going to be here. And it will transform the way you think about life. Because if you are going to die soon, is it going to be important? Let's say that you are on your deathbed. Sometimes it can be very useful to imagine yourself on your deathbed. Are you going to have an argument with someone on your deathbed? It's kind of crazy, right? Come over here, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, yeah, you had said this, you shouldn't have said that. That's the last thing you want to do on your deathbed. Huh? Are you going to crave for all the worldly things on your deathbed? Are you going to think about your next house, your next car, your next relationship? Are you going to think about your status? Yeah, I'm going to climb the career, uh, kind of the, uh, the corporate ladder, whatever it is. All of those things become irrelevant, right? The moment you are thinking about death in the right way and you understand that you could die at any time, all the things of the world start to become quite irrelevant. This is very closely related to what I was talking about before, about the contemplation of rebirth, right? All of these things become irrelevant because the things of the world, you know you're going to have to let them go. What is the point of clinging on to more things in the, in the world when you know you're going to have to let them go? You have no choice. So death contemplation, if you do it in the right way, because it takes away the ill will, you don't want to have an argument with anyone. You want to be peaceful on your deathbed. You don't want to crave or attach to anything on your deathbed. So craving also goes. You become peaceful. So this is why. This is the power of the death contemplation. And this is one of the things that you can do if you feel that you're meditating and you feel you're having problems becoming peaceful. Do some death contemplation. Yeah? I don't know if I'm going to leave BGF Center ever again. <laughs> Yeah, and if you don't know whether you're going to leave the BGF Center, well, now is the time to just really let go, right? Just enjoy what we're doing now, not, not thinking about the future, because you have no future. <laughs> and I love that kind of idea. Sometimes in my, when I do my meditation, I often remind myself, where I think to myself, I have no future. Yeah? And this idea of not having a future is actually a very beautiful contemplation. Huh? Because, yes, in a way, we all have a future because you're going to get reborn, etc., etc. But that future is of a different kind. That's more like the spiritual idea of the future. Usually, when we think about the future, we think about the future in the material world, the worldly kind of future, right? What's going to happen to my family? What is my career going to be like? What is going to happen to my bank account? And these kind of things. But that kind of future is irrelevant. Huh? That kind of future doesn't matter at all. That kind of future you don't have. The only future you may have is a spiritual future. And that spiritual future is made now by meditating now and by living in the right way, right in this very moment. That is where the spiritual future is made. That is the future that matters because that is the future that ultimately will make you happy and will make a difference to you. So remember that. And when you remember that, it's like the things of the world start to fade away. Huh? They start to mean less to you because you understand what matters. Huh? And then when you close your eyes, you say you have no future. Actually, what it means, you come into the present. And it allows you to do the meditation practice. Huh? 
Because the way your real future is created is actually by being present right here and now and doing the meditation. That's how you create the future. Because that's where you create the good qualities that ensure that your mind will be nice and good and beautiful and ready for whatever happens later on. Huh? So actually it's a beautiful way of uh, making yourself present uh, rather than living in the future, which is so common for humanity. Huh? So I really recommend you to do a little bit of uh, death contemplation because it can be very, very powerful. Uh, yeah, maybe once a day or many times a day you can remind yourself of these things. Uh, and if you do it skillfully, it does not lead to fear, it does not lead to sadness, uh, it just leads to living more fully in the present. Uh, so be careful, yeah, when you do this kind of contemplations, uh, ask yourself how they affect you. Huh? If they affect you in a bad way, don't do them. Huh? If they affect you in a good way, that's when you should do them. Huh? So see if you can make them work. Yeah? Uh, some people are scared about the idea of death. Uh, they can't really deal with it properly. In that case, be very gentle with yourself. Uh, but try to affect it in such a way that it starts to work. And actually, it makes a difference in your life. Uh, and then you're going to become a far more peaceful, happy, contented person as a consequence. Uh, it's a paradox, isn't it? Thinking about death makes you happy. Huh? But actually, that's the reality of it. Uh. So, uh, let's do a little bit more meditation together, and we can do a little bit more Q&A afterwards. So.
Okay, so uh, let us do some, do a few questions, and uh, okay, we have a question over here. Hi, Ajahn. Hi. Um, when a person is passing away, say maybe f uh, because of um, illness or old age, and then um, there was a, uh, someone tried to resuscitate the person and so on, so will that uh, disturb the, the ending state of mind of the, the person who is passing away? If they are resuscitated? Huh? If, if there's like attempts to yeah. to resuscitate or do a lot of intervention? I don't think so, because uh, you know when you hear about these near-death experiences, very often what you see, the person has already left the body, uh, and they see all these people frantically trying to revive them, uh, and they are at peace, they're completely at peace with that. Uh, it doesn't really worry them, you know? Uh, and if they succeed, maybe you have to go back again. Uh, and sometimes they say, oh no, no, I don't want to go back, don't want to go back, <laughs> because they're so happy, right? They're so peaceful. Uh, that's kind of the paradox, paradox of these things. Actually, you're very happy to be where you are, but then you are forced to go back. And, you know, once you're back, it's okay. It's not a problem. Uh, so, uh, no, we should always try to resuscitate people because um, that's a good thing to do, yeah? If you really hate someone, then, no, I'm not going to resuscitate you. I'm gonna <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, yeah. last year there was a death in the family and there were different opinions on, on what should be done or, or what should not be done. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely, resuscitate. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, just a short one. I want to know whether contemplation is it considered a bhavana or meditation? Um, I, I, these are just words, you know, I, we, we do, but uh, it's usually called, usually in the suttas it's called uh, marana sati or marana sanya. So it's called the development of a perception or development of the, um, or, or recollection of things. And, uh, you, you know, in the, in the kind of broader scheme of things, everything is bhavana, because bhavana means to develop, that's kind of the root meaning. Uh, it is often used to mean meditation, but actually it really means development of something. Uh, so you have sila bhavana, chitta bhavana. Uh, yeah, sila bhavana means, means development of the virtue, chitta bhavana means development of the mind. Uh, so I would probably say this comes under chitta bhavana, the development of the mind. Uh, but so is it meditation? I mean, again, it depends how you use the word meditation. It is not the kind of meditation where you sit down and watch the breath, because that is a very specific kind of meditation. That is samasati. It's not samasati. Yeah? Samasati is something else. Samasati is watching the breath or something like that. Uh, so this is more meditation, the broader sense of the term. Uh, yeah. Okay, all quiet. Okay, good. Let's, uh, we can carry on. Yep. Okay, so uh, let us go on to the uh, last couple of uh, contemplations that are found here. Uh, we have now seen some of the important ones. Uh, what comes now is a little bit different from what we uh, usually find in the suttas. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at this. Uh, and what should be described as liable to sorrow? You see the word there is soka, sorrow. We're quite similar to sorrow in a sense. Uh, uh, which is fascinating. I wonder if there is a con connection there to soak and sorrow. Uh, um, partners and children, uh, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, uh, chickens and pigs, uh, elephants and cattle are liable to sorrow. Uh, that's already quite interesting, isn't it? The idea that uh, animals are liable to sorrow. Uh, because uh, very much of the kind of worldview that we had in the Western world for a long time that comes from Christianity 
that animals are just like machines. Uh, yeah, they don't really have feelings. Uh, uh, but right here, you can see the idea from the suttas is very different. The idea is that animals have feelings just like uh, and any other beings, uh, yeah? And anyone who has had a close animal in their life, like a pet, a dog, or a cat, or something, uh, will probably know that animals have feelings. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, sometimes it's um, kind of weird how we get this idea that animals are like machines. I don't know where we get these ideas from when it kind of is so intuitively obvious that that actually is not the case. Uh. So they are liable to sorrow. Uh, these attachments are liable to sorrow. Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attached to such things, uh, themselves liable to sorrow, seeks what is also liable to sorrow. So, um, sadness and sorrow and grief and all of these things are part of life, yeah? This is an essential part of existence. Uh, and uh, it's useful again to remember that. Uh, don't think that you're going to be able to live the rest of your life without uh, these things. This is kind of very much part and parcel for what our existence is like. Uh, and even if you haven't got it now, it's going to come back to you. Uh, yeah? Almost everyone is going to have some degree of grief and sorrow in their life. And um, it's interesting, even you know, you, when you read the suttas, you see even people like Venerable Ananda, when the Buddha was about, about to pass away, he was crying, yeah. And he was a stream enter. He was someone who already had seen the Dhamma. You would think that someone like that uh, would not be able to cry because they had a kind of larger scope, a larger understanding of reality. Huh? But these attachments that we have, they are so profound and so deep uh, that even when you have deep insight and deep wisdom into reality, we feel uh, these are nat natural human feelings that come very easily to us. Uh, so sorrow is a natural part of existence. Uh, yeah? Once you attach to things, uh, once you enjoy the world of the five senses, uh, people often say, yeah, what's wrong with enjoying the world of the five senses? Well, what, what is the downside of it is that we sorrow. Uh, there's going to be sadness when there is separation. And that is just part and parcel of life. Uh, and um, it is one of those strange things about the world outside of us. Sometimes people say that, Buddhists exaggerate because we say everything is dukkha, but surely look at the happiness in the world. Yeah, the beautiful sunset, the kind of the nature is very beautiful and all of these kind of things. And the Buddha does not deny that there is happiness in the world of the five senses. There is happiness in that world, right? We all have enjoyment of these things. The problem is that the nature of the world of the five senses is such that when we enjoy it, we also attach to it. Yeah, we grasp on, we crave for these things, we hold on to the things that we enjoy. Why? Because we want to control it. If we can't control it, we lose it, we suffer. We want to control it, that's why we attach. That's the nature of that world. So the, as soon as you start enjoying that world, at, th at that moment you start holding on, grasping to that world, attaching to it, and the moment you grasp, you're asking for suffering. Please, may I suffer? That's what you say him. Yeah, that is the problem. So don't say, please, may I suffer here. There is a nice little simile that is found in the suttas, the similes of the grass torch. And the simile of the grass torch, the Buddha says, that sensual pleasures or the worldly happiness is like a grass torch. You pick up the grass torch and then you hold the grass torch against the wind. When you hold the grass torch against the wind, because it is a grass torch, the embers will come off that grass torch. The embers will hit your robe or whatever you're wearing, and you will start to burn. Yeah? And when you burn, what happens? Well, either you suffer enormously because you get burnt, or you might die. Yeah? And this is the idea of sensual pleasure. If you hold the sensual pleasure, so the first thing is to notice that the grass torch is useful because it gives you light at night when you see, right? In the same way, sensual pleasures have a degree of happiness about them. It's called the asada in the suttas, the gratification of sensual pleasures. But then when you hold them in the wrong way, and holding them in the wrong way is the idea of attaching to these things too firmly. When you attach them to, to them f too firmly, then it's going to hit you, it's going to start burning you, and you're going to have some terrible consequences because of holding those sensual pleasures uh, in the wrong way. Uh. So we should turn around, we should hold the 
sensual pleasures downwind, yeah, away from the windy direction, so that the embers go away from us. Uh, and that means we have no choice. We have to live in the sensory world. The sensory world is always around us. Uh, but we learn to live in the sensory world in such a way that we don't attach so much uh, because we understand the danger of attachment. Uh, so we enjoy our lunch. Yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Yeah, otherwise you're not following my instructions. Uh, <laughs> my instruction is enjoy your lunch uh, because that's what I learned from Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm told me enjoy your lunch and I'm telling you enjoy your lunch. Uh, so enjoy it, but don't attach too much on it. Yeah, you don't attach so much anyway to the lunch, right? Let's face it, you forget about it very quickly afterwards. So uh, you let go of it, uh, and then you carry on. Uh, and this is the same way with everything in this world. Uh, you learn to gradually loosen the grip a little bit. Uh, and when you loosen that grip, uh, then the grass torch doesn't blow with the embers onto an you anymore. And you don't suffer as much as a consequence. Uh, there is less sorrow in your life. There is less grief because of less attachment to these kind of things. So um, then instead of sorrowing because of all the negative things in the world uh, and because of uh, uh, holding on to other things that also sorrow, yeah? if you have a partner, if you have kids, uh, when you die, they will sorrow. When they die, you will sorrow, etc. So you know, it's going to be sorrow all the way around. Uh, you stop that. You let go of these things a little bit. Uh, and as you let go of that world a little bit, and you ascend the mind, you allow the mind to rise to a higher realm, a realm where there's less attachment to the world, where there's more bliss and more happiness, you are a winner all, all around, in all possible directions. So let's come to uh, the next one. And what should be described as liable to corruption? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle, gold and money are liable to corruption. These attachments are liable to corruption. Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attracted, attached to these things, themselves liable to corruption seeks what is also liable to corruption. This is the ignoble search. So here we have this idea of corruption. You can see there that the word for corruption is uh, sankilesa. Yeah, you see the word there? You recognize that word? Yeah. Sankilesa is sang plus kilesa. Kilesa is a kind of standard word for uh, defilement, uh, kilet, the same Thai, and uh, uh, in the suttas it's called sankilesa or upakilesa, and sometimes kilesa, but usually upakilesa is a more common word in the suttas. Uh, and so these things are liable to corruption. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you can see here there's a new, there's a new entry now. Gold and money ha has been added to the list, right? Uh, now, what is interesting about this is that gold and money did not occur previously. It was not part of all the other things, being born, being old and dying, and all that kind of things. And uh, a, a reason for that is because uh, the word birth, old age, sickness and death, uh, the way they are used in the suttas, they are used in a literal way, not in a metaphorical sense. Uh, yeah? And that is a very important observation, because uh, sometimes we think that when the words like death are meant metaphorically, or birth or rebirth are met metaphorically, it does not refer to ordinary rebirth or birth, but it refers to some kind of mental content, the mind being reborn, the mind changing. But actually, these words are not used like that in the sutta. They're not used metaphorically. They are used to literally means birth, old age, and death. So the idea that these things can somehow refer to a bit of dukkha on the side here. So just, uh, just getting, trying to get rid, craving, trying to get rid of dukkha. It's very, very. It's not going to work. But anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, so, um, so they are not used metaphorically. And this is a very important point of dhamma. So when it comes to things like dependent origination, uh, you have a uh, uh, bhava pachya jati jata pachya uh, jaramarana. Yeah, from existence comes birth, from birth comes old age and death. Uh, 
it is not metaphorical in meaning. It means literal birth and it means literal old age and death. It's very, very important and it's very obvious when you know the sutta as well because that's how it is defined everywhere, defined as these kind of things. Uh, so uh, that is kind of the first thing here, yeah? And this is why golden money appears only now, because it could have appeared before, in which case it would have had to have a metaphorical meaning, because of course golden money is not really born, it is made, and metaphorically you can call that birth, but actually that is not how birth is used in the suttas. So. so what does it mean that gold and money are liable to corruption? Well, of course it means that they can be false, yeah, they can be not real golden money, somebody has added too much copper to the gold, <laughs> I'm going to make a killing, I'm going to, you know, not there's not going to be pure gold, I'm going to rip you off and I'm going to charge the full price or something like that. Uh, and this is the problem with the things of the world, when they are liable to corruption, they're liable to being defiled, uh, this is the word sankilesa here, uh, and when they are liable to defilement, liable to being false or whatever, then they are really problematic and they destroy kind of the value of these things, yeah? The value of gold and money is destroyed if they're lying, liable to corruption. Yeah? In the same way, partners and children, because they are liable to corruption, it kind of destroys the idea of having a partner in life, right? Why do we want to have a partner in life? Why do you want to have a girlfriend and boyfriend? Why do you want to have a husband or wife? Why do you want to have any kind of partner, dependent, irrespective of your kind of your ideas of what kind of partner you should have? Why? Well, with usually the reason why we want to have a partner is because we think they are so wonderful. Yeah, when you fall in love with someone, wow, it is so beautiful, it is so wonderful. You forget that the person is liable to corruption. That's what you find out later on. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know you were liable to corruption. That's bad, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, they turn out to have corruptions in them. What are those corruptions? Well, those corruptions are in the human mind are things like anger, huh? things like jealousy, huh? things like greed, things that we don't really want to see in a nice partner, huh? right? These are the corruptions of the human mind, and we all have them. But it's not just that we have them. Huh? Very often, given the right circumstances, given the hanging around the, not the Kalyana Mitta, but the Papa Mitta, you know the Papa Mitta? The bad friend, yeah? Papa is like the evil or bad friend, yes? Yeah? So the Papa Mitta is the bad friend. So don't have Papa Mitta, have a Kalyana Mitta. So by hanging around with the wrong people, being conditioned in the wrong way, these defilements are going to come out. Yeah, these corruptions are there, they are under the surface, waiting to come out, given the right circumstances. And that is what is so scary here. Huh? So our partner, our children, right, when you are, you go away somewhere, you want your children to behave in the right way, and when you are a child, you want your parents to behave in the right way, they're not going to do it, yeah, they are liable to corruption. Huh? You can't control your children, huh? and if you try, it's going to get worse usually. Huh? <laughs> and so, this is kind of the downside of these things. Uh, we don't know where they're going to go. We don't know what's going to happen with these things. Uh, yeah, it takes out the romance of life when we think about life in a very rational way. Uh, it destroys some of the ideas why romantic relationships are so interesting. Actually, uh, when it comes down to it, in the kind of broader view of things, uh, it is not all that interesting at all. But it's incredibly hard to see sometimes. Uh, partner and children are liable to corruption. Male and female bond servants. Maybe you have some very nice servants, very nice slaves, very nice uh, volunteers. <laughs> I, said, I like that one, why? That's a good one. The volunteers are the real slaves of this world. <laughs> I shouldn't say, I, actually, that's not fair to say. I, I really recommend that you volunteer. It's a wonderful thing to do. And to see you as slaves is incredibly unfair. You're making good karma and you're also helping out a good organization like the BGF. So please carry on volunteering. It's a wonderful thing here. <laughs> but uh, they are subject to defilements, right? You have someone who you trust in your house, someone who you kind of, uh, you know, you, you rely on to get the things done, done in your house. Uh, and then they get corrupted. Uh, things go wrong. Uh, they start stealing from you or whatever. That is the reality of these things. Uh, Goats, even goats and sheep and chickens and pigs are subject to defilement. One day they get angry with you, right? 
One day the elephant is no longer happy and they trample on you. And when the elephant tramples on you, you become very flat. Yeah? <laughs> that, is the, that is the downside of ele elephants. And I have heard many cases of monks dying because of elephants. Yeah? Especially in places like Sri Lanka, there's still lots of wild elephants in the forest. And if the elephant has a bad day, it gets corrupted, as it says here, gets angry for whatever reason. That's it. You're finished. Yeah? Happen very, very easily with elephants. They're incredibly powerful animals. So it's all liable to corruption. And anything that is liable to corruption is not really interesting anymore. Corrupt things are not nice. We want pure things in our life. We want beautiful things. We want things that are attractive. We don't want things that are defiled and corrupted and, and kind of... Uh, um, you know, low in a sense. We want high things in our life. That is what is interesting here. Yeah. All of these things are liable to corruption here. Yeah. So you're attached to all of these things that are liable to corruption, yeah. infatuated with them, tied to them, yeah. and because of that you are actually seeking things yeah, that are liable to corruption here. Yeah. Remember that. Yeah. When you're looking for the things in the world, you're seeking things that are liable to corruption. It is not so nice all of a sudden. Uh, suddenly, the um, sheen is taken off these things. Uh, this is the ignoble search. So now you can see why this is ignoble, right? It's pretty obvious, uh, because it is, uh, leads to suffering, it leads to problems, uh, it leads to all kinds of negative things. Uh, it is not the no noble mind that is pure. The noble mind is not that stands back, uh, that sees reality with a clear mind, is careful, is circumspect, has a degree of wisdom, has the yoni somana sikara, has the sati sampajanya, to be able to stand back and see clearly what is going on here. So let's find out a bit more about this noble search. What is the noble search? It is when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn, understanding the drawbacks of being liable to reborn, seeks the unborn supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Yeah? So the moment you understand the drawbacks of being liable to being reborn, yeah? That is really the critical thing here. Uh, I mentioned before we were talking about the pleasures of the world. I said the pleasures of the world, they have a degree of happiness to them, right? Uh, when we enjoy a nice meal, when we have a nice relationship, there is a degree of happiness in that. Uh, but what we often forget is the downside. We forget the drawback, and that is the problem. Uh, every nice relationship must end in separation. That is the drawback of a nice relationship. Uh, Every nice and relationship may end in corruption, as we have just seen now. This is the drawback. Yeah? And so the Buddha weighs up the drawbacks and the advantages, uh, and he says the drawback is far greater. Uh, and there is a greater reality beyond. That is, is the nisarana, the escape. The three things that Buddha talks about in the suttas, asada, adinava, and nisarana. Asada is the gratification or pleasure in something. The uh, Adinava is the danger or drawback, and the Nisarana is the escape. So you weigh it up, and you see that the actual drawback is really enormous. Then there is the escape, and of course the escape from the sensory world is the world of Samadhi, yeah? the world of the jhanas. And it's a far more happy, far more satisfactory and contented world than the world of the worldly things, the sen sensory pleasures of the world. So you weigh things up and you decide, okay, I'm going to go for the escape because the world of the five senses is just too dangerous. There's too many downsides, too much suffering. I've had enough of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. Now I want to move out of this. So understanding the drawbacks, you seek the unborn. Yeah, Unborn is here the ajata. You see it over here, the ajatang. Yeah? And uh, so the unborn here, what it uh, really means, it means the freedom from birth, uh, or freedom from being reborn. Uh, 
The A is what is called a private prefix, and it means like the, fr the freedom from that thing, from that word it is in front of. Ajatang, non-birth, freedom from birth. So you see the danger in birth, you seek the freedom from birth. And this is what is meant here by the unborn, the freedom from birth. It doesn't mean some kind of unborn state, it just means the freedom from that birth. Yeah, so you seek uh, that freedom from birth, uh, the supreme sanctuary, uh, Anuttarang Yoga Kemang. Yeah, you see right here, Yoga Kemang. Yeah. Anuttarang Yoga Kemang, the supreme sanctuary. Uh, yoga in Pali does not mean the kind of exercises you do when you're sitting on the floor, yeah, or lying on the floor, the kind of the asana, that's not what it means. Uh, yoga has two meanings in the suttas, and one meaning is exertion, you are exerting yourself, uh, and another meaning is the word yoke. You yoke things together, and you can see that the word yoke in English is related to the word yoga in Pali. It's the same word. Remember, we're dealing with the same languages. These are called the Indo-European languages. So all of these languages are linked to each other. Lots of English words are come straight out of Sanskrit and Pali. Yoga and yoke are connected. So yoke is when you yoke things together, and of course when you yoke oxen together to pull the the plow or to pull the cart or whatever, that's when work gets done. So the yoking is very similar to the idea of exertion. So kema means like safety or freedom from something. So here we have the safety or the ending of exertion. Yeah, the freedom from exertion. That's why it is called the uh, supreme sanctuary here because you no longer have to exert yourself on the Buddhist path. You have found the sanctuary, the liberation, the, prob the, uh, the place where uh, all of these problems come to an end and there's no more exertion that is required from you. Huh? So this is the idea of the, the yoga keman, the supreme sanctuary. Sanctuary is a nice word for yoga kema. Uh, sanctuary is like this uh, feeling that you can relax for once in your life. Uh, there's nothing more to be done. You can kind of be at ease for once. Uh, you have been persecuted all your life. By what? By greed, hatred, and delusion. Persecuted by your own defilements. Now finally you find a rest from those blooming defilements. And now you can really chill for the first time. <coughs> so, um, yeah. So, uh, and of course that... Uh, and that supreme sanctuary is also called Nibbana, right? The next word here is Nibbana. And Nibbana here translated by Bhante Sujato as extinguishment. Yeah, you have extinguished things in your life. What have you extinguished? You have extinguished the defilements of the mind that are so problematic and always causing so much suffering for yourself. You have extinguished suffering itself. No more suffering. This is what extinguishment refers to. Yeah, so uh, you have found that uh, uh, sanctuary from all of these kind of things. Uh, it is very important to translate words like Nibbana. If you don't translate a word like Nibbana, people will read anything into it, uh, right? Uh, but the point is that the word Nibbana has a very specific meaning. Uh, remember these are teachings that were given in the Indian context two and a half thousand years ago, and in that Indian context, uh, when the Buddha was giving teaching to the audience in front of him, they knew the meaning of Nibbana. For them it had a meaning. But if I tell you the word Nibbana, it means nothing, right? It doesn't have any meaning to you. It's just Nibbana, sure, I know what it means. No, actually you don't know what it means. <laughs> because you are not grown up with Sanskrit or Pali, so you don't know. So because of that, it's important that we translate it. That we hear the same meaning as the ancient Indians were hearing when they heard these words. That's why it should be translated as extinguishment. And then we are closer to understanding what these things are about. So this is, to my mind, the right way of translating for that reason. Yeah, so you seek the freedom from birth, the supreme sanctuary, extinguishment. And perhaps you think that extinguishment doesn't sound so interesting. I don't want to be extinguished, thank you very much. <laughs> If you don't want to be extinguished, the door is over there. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be extinguished. <laughs> this is here you are on the path to extinguishment. And so we see here what the Buddha does. He kind of balances things out a little bit. 
He used the term extinguishment on the one hand, which is like a slightly negative term, uh, but on the other hand, he uses the word sanctuary, which is a very positive term. Uh, and this is very important when we think about the Buddhist teachings. The negative is always balanced by the positive. Uh, yeah, because the negative, the reason why the Buddha used the negative terms uh, is because these teachings are very profound. Uh, and the full profundity can really only be understood through the negative terms. Uh, but through, from our point of view, through the point of view of ordinary people, these are very positive and happy states. Uh, yeah, it is the, these are the highest happiness you can, you can possibly get in the world. Uh, yeah. So it's very important to remind ourselves that when the Buddha uses a negative term because of the profundity, actually, for most people, it has a very, very positive meaning. These are very, very happy things. You cannot find greater happiness in your existence than these things. So the balance is always there. And that's why we should be very careful, as I like to say, to be too negative in Buddhism. Yeah? You always hear from other people, oh, you, you Buddhist, you're so negative. Yeah, Dukkha here, Dukkha there, Dukkha everywhere. And <laughs> don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. But actually, when you start reading the suttas, there's also sukkha everywhere. There's happiness everywhere, right? The Buddhist path of meditation is full of happiness. It's such a beautiful path. And I think that if we are get better at marketing the Buddhist teachings, we're going to have more success in the world to have more people become Buddhist, because everyone should be a Buddhist. Isn't that right? Why isn't everyone a Buddhist? This is the best teachings in the world. Doesn't, don't other people want the best teachings? They're missing out, right? Listen, mate, you're missing, <laughs> you're missing out on these beautiful teachings. To me, it's kind of obvious, you know. I grew up in a Christian country, and Christianity, they are nice Christian people. But the teachings in Christianity, I don't know, don't make any sense to me, sorry. <laughs> I, you know, when you compare the content of the Bible with the content of the suttas, it's like, Night and day, right? I mean, seriously, how, how can you even begin to read the Bible after reading the suttas? I'm just saying, listen, okay, read properly. <laughs> uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense at all. I th um, to me, these are the best suttas. And I think sometimes we are, we are not really selling the suttas properly, selling the Buddhist teaching properly, because they are so really so beautiful. Uh, if anyone wants to be happy, if anyone wants to discover the meaning of life, this is where it is found. Uh, it is very difficult to see how it can be found on some of these other teachings. Uh, anyway, I'm not going <laughs> to... Let's uh, move on. Um, so then, we have of course the same thing with all of these other problems. Uh, themselves liable to grow old, to fall sick, to die, to sorrow, to become corrupted, uh, understanding the drawbacks in these things, uh, they seek the unaging, the unailing, the undying, the sorrowless, uh, the uncorrupted supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh, yeah, so here uh, we have the same problems, so you are seeking the freedom from these things. Yeah? He has here the unaging, but really, I, I think a better translation would be to call it the freedom from old age. He has the unailing, I would call that the freedom from sickness. The undying, I would call it the freedom from death. Uh, sorrowless, freedom from sorrow. Uh, uncorrupted, freedom from corruption. I mean, they are basically the same meaning, but it's a little bit more clear when we say freedom from corruption. Um, so, again, yeah, the ending of all the problems in life, this is what the Buddha is actually uh, is, um, promising us here with these things. Uh. And one of the things I didn't mention before, which maybe I should mention very briefly, because what we are dealing with here is rebirth, uh, we are also dealing with not just not aging, we are dealing not with just with aging, but with re-aging. Uh. We're not just dealing with dying, but re-dying. Yeah? Not just sorrow, but re-sorrow. And re-corruption. <laughs> so the idea here is that the sequence of terms is always the same. Birth comes first. And because birth is rebirth, all of these things are the carrying on of these problems into the future. Yeah? The fact that we die not only once, but again and again and again in future lives. That is the real problem. 
if you were only to die once in this particular life, and that would be the end of it, you could probably deal with it. Yeah, once is okay. But the problem is the ongoing process of these things carrying on again and again for an unlimited time into the future. So what we're doing here is we're stopping this process. We will still die in this life. When we say the Buddha has found the undying, it doesn't mean the Buddha will not die. Of course the Buddha will die. Everyone has to die, whether you're arahant or whatever. But it means that re-dying, re-old age, all of these things have come to an end. Birth comes first, and therefore all of these things also have to do with the re-occurring of these processes. So undying, the freedom from death, and all the way down. And again, it is the supreme sanctuary, yeah, the extinguishment uh, that we then are leaning towards, uh, and what this is all about. Uh, and this is the noble search. Uh, and you can start to see why it is called noble, right? Uh, because it is very, it's kind of uh, amazing that anyone in the world would go out and search for these things. Uh, yeah, I always found it kind of one of the things that I really am so impressed about, about the Buddha or the Buddha to be, is that he's staying at home in an ordinary life. Yeah, and he was a wealthy person living in a wealthy family. He had really everything that he wanted. And then he says, I'm going to find a solution to death. And then he wanders off into the forest somewhere to find a solution to death. <laughs> and that's kind of amazing, right? It's kind of extraordinary. Of course, it helped to kind of be in the society in ancient India, where there were seekers, there were philosophers, there were religious teachers who did this kind of thing. But there's something very audacious about that, uh, finding a solution to death. And this is what makes the Buddha so special. He had these incredibly powerful spiritual qualities that made him have the confidence to find something that no one else in the world has the confidence to seek. That is what makes the Buddha so supreme. And this is why this is called the noble search, because we're trying to find something that actually is very elusive, very difficult to find, and it takes extreme spiritual qualities to even dare to enter that particular path. All right, so um, uh, let us do a little bit more meditation practice. And just to have a chill a little bit, do a little bit more questions, and then we have a tea break afterwards. So.
Okay, everyone. So uh, uh, let's do some a few questions before we have a tea break. Yeah. So yes, please, Bobby, over here. Yeah. Mike. Uh, after the extinguishment, mm -hmm. how does one feel the bliss, and where does the consciousness go to? Ah, okay. So, uh, okay. So, how do you feel the bliss? So, the um, remember the some of the teachings of the Buddha are very profound, right? And uh, one of the problems with uh, uh, this kind of question is that um, it's very hard to understand some of these things. And so sometimes if the Buddha tells you something, you may think, well, I, I'm not sure if I'm interested in that because it sounds kind of scary. So I think it's important to understand the idea of Nibbana in the right kind of way. So Nibbana, and this is what really matters as far as I'm concerned. The Buddha says Nibbana is the highest happiness. It's the ending of all suffering, right? It is the highest meaning of life. And it's the extinguishment of all defilements. And to me, that is what really is important because if I understand, that I can understand, I can relate to the idea of the highest happiness, I can relate even a little bit to the idea of ending of defilements of the mind. Uh, but uh, some of these ideas may be too difficult to relate to. So extinguishment, what does it mean? Well, think about it and allow the idea to kind of grow on you to understand what it means. Uh, uh, but um, uh, it is, um, uh, and the reason why it is so hard to understand is because we are all deluded, yeah? and, the, and the kind of the root delusion is the, is the sense of self. And the sense of self, if I say that you will be extinguished, the sense of self says, thank you very much, but I'm not interested in that. But it's not you saying that, it's the sense of self saying that, right? The sense of self gets in the way. So to really understand what extinguishment is, first of all, you have to let go of the sense of self, because that gets in the way of understanding these profound concepts. So sometimes I don't like to answer those questions because I know that it's impossible for people to understand. Uh, and then they might get turned away from Buddhism. Uh, so much better to kind of have the idea, okay, the highest happiness, uh, I can deal with that. Uh, the end of defilements, I can deal with that. Uh, but when the Buddha talks about non-self, uh, if you don't even understand non-self, how can you understand Nibbana? Because these things relate to it. So try to understand non-self first. Uh, once you understand non-self in a deep way, then Nibbana is going kind to of become obvious what it must mean. Uh, it's no longer a problem. Uh. But to give an idea of what the Buddha means, yeah, to give you some idea, there's a famous sutta where the, there is a, a monk called Venerable Udayin. He says that, well, if Nibbana, how can Nibbana be happiness when no, nothing is felt in Nibbana? How can something be happiness when nothing is felt? Uh? And the answer is, it is precisely because nothing is felt that it is happiness. <laughs> Where does the consciousness go to? Huh? Well, w w you wanted to go somewhere? Huh? What, what, why are you interested in that question? Huh? Because, well, yeah. the, the body is supposed to be impermanent, and, uh, but, yeah. but the consciousness is supposed to go on and on. And yeah, what if it doesn't go on? Huh? So extinguished, well, yeah. does the consciousness extinguish too? Where it extinguishes to? It's like the fire goes out. Where does the fire extinguish to? Yeah, I know. If the fire is, is extinguished, where does it get extinguished to? Nowhere. It just gets extinguished. So the the thing is that what is interesting to me is why people ask that question. There, people ask, well, what happens with consciousness in nibbana? And the reason they are interested in that question is because of sense of self. That's the only reason. There. If there is no sense of self, they wouldn't even be interested in that question. There, because it would be obvious. It just goes out. No problem. There. So the sense of self, that's what I mean by the sense of self getting in the way. The sense of self, it would ask those questions. Uh, not really, the, it doesn't, and that's why I find it problematic and difficult, because uh, I know it is very hard to grasp. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bobby, over here. Yeah. yeah. So, Pihotu Ajahn. Uh, this is reading to the to this sutta. So this sutta only mentioned about the human and animal realms. Mm. How about the other realms like ghosts? Uh, yeah. They are also liable to be reborn. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, the, but the reason why it is not mentioned is because we're talking about the property of this person, right? Uh, he is the owner of these things, so he owns the animals. Uh, so that's why it is dukkha for him when the animals die. But if the ghost dies, no problem for this person, right? Uh, <laughs> He does, that's not an issue.
But yes, if you want to look at the broader context, then yes, of course, animal realms, hell realms, deva realms, yeah, Brahma realms, uh, and realms beyond that. Uh, there's all kinds of realms, uh, and uh, to sometimes you have to understand all of those realms to understand happiness and suffering properly. Uh, when you understand everything, only then can you fully understand happiness and suffering, and then you can make a dis decision whether giving up everything is okay or not. Yeah. But yes. Petaloka. Please. So we talk about the various contemplations on uh, sickness, uh, old age, yeah. death. Uh, uh, well, in my own experience, taking it positively or in a proper way, it can be quite, quite nice yeah. to, to contemplate and to have that sort of motivation to, to do. But I think the other aspect is as I interact with people and myself as well included, it can also be taken in a very cynical way. Yeah, and says that you know I don't care about any, any of this anymore. So right. what the heck, you know, yeah. uh, f forget about life and so on. It can turn the other aspect. So uh, your advice on this? Uh, yeah. The supplementary question would be: Would be, would writing my eulogy be a very helpful tool to help me with with these kind of <laughs> contemplations? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Um, yes, it can be taken in a cynical way. I, I know people who. Are, kind of take the Buddhist teaching the wrong way. And when you take it the wrong way, it's like grabbing the snake by the tail. The snake turns around and bites you. Huh? And this is a famous simile in the sutta. It's found in Majjhima Nikaya 22, the Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake. Yeah? And so be careful not to take, the, take it the wrong way. Huh? Uh, when you see that uh, there is suffering in the world, uh, the right response is not to be cynical. The right response is to have compassion. Huh? Yeah, because you see the suffering in the world. Uh, and that compassion, remember, we can do things. Yeah. And this is the reason why we are here together now, because we want to do something about that suffering in the world. It is possible to overcome it. And part of the path of overcoming the suffering is precisely to have compassion. Uh, we are just talking now about right view, and from this understanding of all the suffering in the world, one of the after right view comes Samma Sankappa. It is the result of right view. And one of those Samma Sankappa is the Abhihingsa, Sankappa. Avihingsa means non-harming, yeah, or, or in other words, compassion. Huh? Yeah, so compassion is actually one of the right kind of intentions on the Buddhist path. Huh? And so if you don't have compassion, huh, if you don't do things in the right way, actually you're not even allowing the second factor to flourish properly and to develop properly. So right view should give rise to compassion. That is the right way. Huh? And we can do a lot of good in the world if we are compassionate to others. Uh, you know, we can really be very supportive. Uh, and it's a very important part in your own practice. You're letting yourself down if you're not compassionate. Uh, if you're cynical, you're blocking your own path to awakening by being cynical. Uh, so please develop compassion, develop care, develop metta, develop understanding, develop some renunciation by keeping precepts, etc. And as you do that, then you are on the right track. Uh, Never be cynical. There are so many teachings in the Buddhism that can be taken the wrong way. Another teaching that is often taken the wrong way is the teaching of kamma, yeah, where people say, "Oh, yeah, they they are kind of uh, they are uh, you know had an accident because of bad kamma. Yeah, it's their own fault. I'm not going to help them. It's their own fault. Yeah, they have been bad. They are bad people. Never think like that. It's incredibly cynical and completely the wrong way of thinking about the, these teachings." Uh, or you see someone who is born in a very poverty or born in a crippled body and you think, yeah, it's their own fault. Uh, yeah? It's crazy because we all have this bad karma in us. Uh, in your next life, you might be that crippled because of some karma you made a long time ago. Uh, yeah? It is all there waiting to come out. Uh, and unless we make an end of samsaric existence, we're going to make that kind of karma again and we're going to be reborn in that state. Uh, and anyway, that person who did that bad karma, maybe it wasn't even bad karma. Maybe sometimes when you get reborn as a human, this is what happens to you. Because rebirth as human, there's all these possibilities. We don't know exactly how we're going to be reborn as a human. Not everything is a result of karma. Sometimes it is just a result of being born as a human. And even if they did bad karma, why did they do the bad karma anyway? Because they are deluded because they don't understand reality. It's not because they are inherently evil or bad, it's simply because they are in darkness in the world. So again, they're worthy of even more compassion because of that. So never 
look down upon them, never be hard on people because they are in bad circumstances, never think it is their fault. Uh, all of this is really the wrong understanding of the Buddhist teachings. Always have, have compassion. Uh, you will also make the same mistakes in the future. You are not superior just because you are more happy in this life. Uh, it just happens that in the last life maybe it was the other way around. Now it's this way around. Uh, who is superior, who is inferior? You can't really say. There is no inferior and superior. It's just changing conditions, that is all. Uh, so um, we, we, have, we need to be very careful with these teachings. Uh, so should you write your own eulogy right now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's an interesting exercise to do that. Uh, and then you can, uh, you know, you can say, and then you can actually remember all the good things in your own life, right? Because that's actually what happens when you write a eulogy, because you're always praising each other. And that's kind of nice, yeah? Maybe you become more uh, realistic about yourself. We tend to be too self-critical very often. Uh, but everyone here has so many good qualities. Uh, Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. There's no point in coming here unless you have good, good qualities. Uh, so uh, sometimes write them down. Write your own eulogy. And you can tell the people around you when my funeral is, no one is to say a word. You re just read this. And this is what I want to hear <laughs> at the funeral ceremony. Right? And then when you are dead, you are a ghost. You hear all this. You get really happy because you hear all these nice, nice things. Uh, so you have <laughs> kind of double, double benefit. Uh, so uh, yeah, that might actually be a very interesting exercise. Anyway, let us uh, take half an hour's break. Uh, let's have some tea and coffee or whatever, and we'll see you all back again at uh, 4.45.